Hey, everybody. Welcome back with Dr. C's and myself here for another episode of Sex, Drugs, and at the Epigenome. Uh, Doc, we are on episode eight. Amazing. It's roughly nine weeks of doing this content. How, how fun is that? And, and the responses have been fantastic. Please continue to send them our way. Uh, if you have any health questions, um, burning health questions about anything, it could be about your nutrition, it could be about your workouts, your fitness, your intermittent fasting, your plateauing. Maybe you have a question about some sort of chronic disease that you've, you've, you've hit a dead end on, whatever it may be. Uh, Doc Seeds is here to give you his input. Um, and certainly, uh, as a disclaimer, he's not, he's not anyone's doctor. This is all for educational purposes only. Uh, please always consult your doctor and your own healthcare providers and your whole, own healthcare professionals for your own diagnostics for your official care. Uh, that said, uh, I am, th this is a topic for today that has uh, really spurred from last week's topic. Um, someone sent a question about, whether vaping was indeed as bad as or good as you hear on on um, media today um and on the last episode which by the way if you missed it and i say this about every episode but that one in particular was such a good one it's like it, it's like with the times of what's happening please look, go take a listen on um apple spot apple spotify and google podcast or live on youtube uh, we, you can watch these videos. We, we're, we're on, a, on our webcams on, on YouTube channels. So go check that out. But listen to that before you listen to this one, because this is kind of the, the part two of that. So let's dive right into that second part two. And we had left off on the last episode on how vaping is good or bad for you. Go listen, then you'll find out. But the secondhand smoke of vaping, right? We know that the cigarette smoke is no bueno. But what about the secondhand smoke of the the vapes? The what is it? The vapors coming out. So, Doc, give, give us the skinny. Let us know. So, so there is, you know, there needs to be concern. There is, there are consequences of being around the vape uh, smoke also because it does it does have nicotine. Um, it does have other fine particles, especially if it is. You know, the concern has been the flavoring and what that adds to this process of how it causes some significant inflammatory changes in the lungs. Um, they do have these fine particles that we don't know a lot about long term, but they're there. And that's a problem. And there are carcinogens that have been identified also in this vapor. So, uh, of course, there have been no long term studies, but I don't think there need to be, in my opinion. Um, based on what we know from just smoking, you know, I didn't, it, know, I didn't know there were carcinogens in the in the vapors. Yes. Well, that alone is it tells you that it's it's not a good thing. Well, you know that people can will make arguments. There are carcinogens in everything, um, but it's the amount you know you're exposed to, and and that's always the argument with with everything. And I would just say, well, you know that that's fine and good, but I've already got a track record on this. That is smoking does this. Well, you need to convince me that this smoking through vapes doesn't create the same problem, but it, we've, we've already seen this incredibly dangerous problem with the pulmonary issues that happen with these flavored vape, you know, and how it changes the, the dynamics of uh, causing uh, emergency situations and um, long-term problems that I think are going to be more focused on fibrosis of the lungs, things like that, on top of the things we don't know about the carcinogens and this, these, these um, small particles that are definitely in this, this vape uh, um, smoke. So I, I think those are very concerning issues that people are, we're starting to see more literature coming out. Um, showing the dangers of this, uh, but we're certainly not seeing that on primetime um, TV right now or anything uh, like it used to be with just the flavoring part. But I think we'll start to see more of that uh, as we see more more articles come out validating that this is a serious issue that needs to be considered, not just primary, but secondary smoke 
mm. from vaping is uh, is something you need to be cognizant of as a individual, and that yes, you can get nicotine. You know, so pregnant females, people that shouldn't be exposed to any nicotine at all. You've got to be concerned about this. So it is not an innocuous thing. And it's people saying, well, this vapor is nothing. Well, that's just not true. Jeez. Um, I have two follow-up questions to that. The first is what kind of small particles are we dealing with? And second, is is it worse, you know, when you're when when you're younger, right? Because vaping is really popular amongst teens. Uh, and and is it is it worse to like expose your body to those kinds of carcinogens and those smart particles? particles uh, at a younger age rather than at an older age and what could that potentially lead to outside of fibrosis like if you're starting that young well so they're what they are is they're just really ultra fine particles meaning very very small um, particles that they're not they haven't uh, I don't know if we have a complete identification of what these are oh wow it's just like all the carcinogens we don't know you know we know that there are things like uh, toluene, which is a carcinogen, and lead and formaldehyde, things like that, are in these, this vape smoke. Um, so those are three carcinogens we absolutely know about. Other ones we're just we don't know. I mean, there's still things we're finding out. Just like um, we don't know all the carcinogens in in uh, in tobacco yet. You know, but we've identified some through time, you know, like the uh, uh, like the lead and toluene and the formaldehyde just from uh, from long term studies. But we know that's in this vape. So we know those are carcinogens. So that's oh, how wow. you say that. Yeah. So but my the, definition, my definition of carcinogen was completely wrong. And I just looked it up. So it's pretty much anything that causes cancer. I thought it was an actual chemical thing. That's oh, like, no, 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 no. Yeah. Oh, wow. so it's anything that causes cancer. Wow, that's even scarier. <laughs> and if everything does indeed have a carcinogen in it, then wouldn't it be a good thing to try to limit what you're putting in your body by not vaping or getting secondhand vape? Well, yeah, these are things that are just absolutely can lead to, I mean, they're, they're number one, they're foreign entities that are in your body that are gonna create some type of immune response anyways. So, I mean, that's number one. Uh, number two, what's happening is people, because they believe that this is not like smoking, they're doing it more. And because it's flavored, they're doing it more and more young people are being pulled into this, which is, which is horrible. Because the long-term effects, I mean, you know, cancer has a significant effect based on exposure and time. So just imagine these people starting out earlier in life with things like this. Uh, it, it's, it's, I think it can be catastrophic um, and have significant um, unfortunate, you know, leading to unfortunate problems like chronic um, pulmonary type of diseases that we can't really treat effectively right now. You know, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is a serious problem. It's not all due to smoking. I mean, there are other issues that, that lead to it, but smoking is a big issue that is secondary to that. And those people are, are at significant risk. I mean, those are the people right now, you know, if you smoke, you're a higher risk for COVID. You know, you are a higher risk for COVID. And if you have any type of uh, COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, you are at higher risk for COVID in, and I, I mean, having bad sequelae of being in the hospital and potentially intubated and potentially succumbing to, you know, dying from the disease. So those are serious things um, that I think people need to be aware of. Serious things. And I, I want to say just, it, it's got to be having, having, you know, loved ones in the hospital and intubated. I mean, it is very, very painful. It's a painful experience. Yeah. Not well, worth it. Sure. And, and something else I, I just, just to bring up about hospital issues um, that made me think of this, but the, the, num the bigger thing I think about are the people like that are asthmatics, people that are triggered. Well, guess what? 
vaping triggers secondary smoke triggers asthmatics. It, it it'll trigger an oh, asthmatic wow. attack. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty significant percentage of people that can be affected by that. So so you are harming other people with what you're doing, and and people with asthma are um, are at significant risk with that also. This reminds me, and this is completely not medical or 100% anecdotal, but there was a scare back in the 90s. I don't know if you remember this stuff, but um, when, or maybe late late 80s, early 90s, when um, there was a big scare for HIV, AIDS, mm-hmm. and um, there was this warning not to go to any nightclubs at the time because people were getting stabbed with needles infected with AIDS and HIV. I laugh about it now because it, it seems so ridiculous at the time, but it was a serious thing. I almost, and, and while this isn't HIV AIDS, it is giving somebody potential harm that may be but, intended or unintended. So no, ab- absolutely. It's, it's that false pretense that, Hey, this is, this is vape smoke. It's not the same. Well, they're absolutely wrong. It is. And you're infringing on other people's rights. Um, you're affecting their life. So that's a big deal. It absolutely is. Um, well, thank you for that. That, that certainly helps. Um, for all my vape fr- vaping friends out there, it's time to switch to the patch. And speaking of the patch, the nicotine patch, we kind of touched upon this last week, but um, you, were <laughs> you were almost uncomfortable on camera last week, Doc, when you were saying, okay, I need to be a little, little gentle with this because there is a bad side to nicotine and there's a very good side to nicotine. And it's about some kind of a balance, but we didn't have time to get to that. So if you don't mind kind of filling us in on uh, first, you know, what makes it bad and then what makes it good and then some potential solutions that, that you have up your sleeve. So you got me to talk about that? Please did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm trying to think, well, what, did I, what I was leading towards is, um, so smoking, you know, when you're smoking, most smokers, um, they smoke, you know, it's just not one cigarette, it's a pack a day or whatever. It's, they're, they're constantly bombarding the body with nicotine. So nicotine affects nicotinic receptors, specific receptors, and it, it, it acts very quickly. It's metabolized quickly in the liver. Um, it's, it's absorbed in the lungs very quickly. Um, and it has... It, it saturates its receptors quickly and and causes oversaturation to where if it's constant, then you know that's kind of one of the issues that causes addiction and and those type of issues. But initially, it it has like it it can inc- improve like serotonin release. It it can do some good things. And, and that's why people get addicted to it because it does have some, uh, some cognitive enhancement is, uh, aspects. Um, but it's, it's a short term thing. Uh, meaning like we have studies now that we, we know that if we use nicotine in low doses, like through a patch, um, you can help. We actually can use that in low dosing where we're not oversaturating the receptor. And we're kind of cycling the use of it. Um, we can do good things for people with cognitive problems that, that the nicotinic receptors can be positively affected. And in fact, what's an interesting, I mean, I always like bringing up interesting facts, I guess. I don't know if I brought this up last time. Um, uh, but the, the, uh, this there's this receptor it's called uh alpha 7 nicotinic uh acetylcholine receptor and it's a receptor it's a muscarinic receptor or, or a, a acetylcholine receptor um but the the key to this is it has it it can control inflammation and you can do good things with it well what's interesting in the brain is people with if if we take a a population of people like schizophrenia that's a a bad problem a bad disease they have a very very high rate of smoking 
And the reason is, is because they found a way to self-medicate themselves with nicotine because nicotine can help improve and regain some of the cognition they need. Like it, it's, but it's very short term because it, it, it's metabolized and it saturates the, that receptor, like I said. Um, so they, they get these little bursts of improved cognition and it becomes something that they are really trying to help themselves with. It's a really interesting, actually, when you read the literature with this, it's really fascinating um, how this, that this discovery was kind of made like, wait a second, this is really interesting. In schizophrenia, nicotinic receptors are, can be a positive thing. And then looking back um, and looking at studies, they found that, oh my gosh, look at this. These, they are the high, one of the highest rate of smoking for a disease, but they're self-medicating. They're, they're trying to help themselves. And um, so we know we're learning more and more about the brain and how this receptor is something that can be beneficial when stimulated the right way. And that's to not oversaturate it um, and to, um, and potentially use other type of agonists, meaning, uh, molecules or peptides or things that can affect that receptor and upregulate it with over, without oversaturating it like nicotine can. Because here's the, so the interesting thing about nicotine is it's, it's a weaker stimulant. It's a weaker, uh, it has a weaker affinity for that, for specifically for alpha seven nic nicotinic um, acetylcholine receptor. So meaning you you've got to use a lot of it to get that stimulation but then when you use a lot of it you do desaturate it but it it's it it has it still has an effect and there's other things that can that can be utilized that you don't need to use a lot of but that are effective in stimulating that receptor that can you know to be good for you so that's kind of the issue about nicotine and why it can be bad and good at the same time I just don't like, I, I guess when I brought it up or when you brought that up, I just didn't want to give people the misconception that, oh yeah, taking nicotine is a great thing. Well, it really isn't. It, it needs to be supervised in how it's used, but there are much better things than nicotine to improve cognition or to work on inflammation, things like that. And the right, the right those, way. And those other solutions, because this is fascinating stuff, right? Um, I wonder if it'll be useful for people that are addicted. Well, is it any form of addiction? So if you're addicted via smoking cigarettes versus vape. Um, and then this follow-up question would be, um, is, are these other molecules like peptides and, and these other things, um, are they more long-term rather than that short-term burst that you said? Yeah, so, so hmm. you ask a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> I'm curious. Yeah. Um, so where do I start with that? Uh, the, let me go with the end part first. Uh, so there are things like there, there are peptides, like there's a peptide called uh, melanocyte stimu alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, which is a peptide. And there are brands of this that are available um, for prescription um, that can stimulate this, receptor, this alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptor that actually is on a lot of immune cells. And by, by working through the uh, what's called the anticholinergic, um, the vagus anticholinergic uh, uh, nerve, there can be, it can stimulate these receptors. Um, that's how it works in the brain from the brain to the body. It, the brain sends, um, these alpha, um, uh, these, uh, alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone. Um, they send that signaling to through the vagus nerve from the brain down into the gut, uh, to cause certain positive, uh, uh anti-inflammatory type of, of, of uh, reactions and it can be it can be anywhere actually but the gut is specifically which has been identified but these alpha uh, these alpha 7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are everywhere they're in the brain they're in the bowel 
but this is just specific and like we know for inflammatory diseases, this can reverse and change like inflamed type of macrophages where they're, they we call, they go through a phase change and they become an, a pro-inflammatory, meaning a bad inflammatory type of immune cell. And this, you, your brain has ways of, of changing that, like people who get mold exposure and Lyme's disease and those, and and toxin type of diseases, they have a lower, usually most of all of them have a low level of this alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone that's produced in the, it's called the melacortin system, uh, has multitude of melacortins, but we're just specific to this. And those people are over inflamed um, and they have significant issues. And Actually, I was just on a podcast uh, with a really smart guy that uh, interviewed me out in on the West Coast who deals with a lot of this disease. And, and we talked uh, quite a bit about this um, for, boy, a long time, actually. And had, he had amazing questions. Um, one of the most prepared podcasts I've ever been on in my entire podcast career. I was very, I was fascinated by this, actually. Drop him a shout out, Doc. What's it that? Better, it was the Better Health Guy podcast. Yes, thank you. I, I, <laughs> you know, I can remember any pathway in the body, and I am horrible with names, and that's just a terrible thing. I mean, maybe that makes me human, maybe not. I don't know. Um, but yes, that's who it was. Thank you. That was oh, embarrassing. That was embarrassing. Also, <laughs> that is so. What you're what you're describing almost sounds like this peptide that is hitting the nicotine receptors are it, it's 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 gotta it's almost is it killing off the senescent cells the zombie cells is that what it's doing no it's but well it's similar. working, it's working oh. and trying to control inflammation so it has an effect of it has an effect it, it is a modulator of senescence absolutely mm -hmm. um it and you i wouldn't call it a um a senescent uh, peptide, but I would call it a senomodulator, or a, it modulates senescence, uh, and that's significant, especially in these chronic diseases. Um, and then there's other fragments of this, um, smaller fragments of that peptide that we think have have uh, work also in that repair network, um, but they don't. We're not sure if it specifically affects that alpha-7 nicotinic um, acetylcholine receptor or that alpha-7 nicotinic muscarinic receptor, that's in muscle because you have those in muscle and that can be a good thing too. Um, but I believe it has to have that effect because we're seeing these anti-inflammatory effects and that's the receptor. So it's, it's really interesting, very, very interesting. And of course, that's my focus is signaling, cell signaling. And uh, I love all those uh, you know, seeing all those networks. And it's like when I get to, you know, when I see things like that on on uh, TV about vaping and all the bad things, I, I realize all that. And then I get to see the good things too that are on the other side of that where we can control those receptors that they disrupt, you know? So it's, it's, it's all, you bring some neat things up and it just, we can talk about a lot. Yeah. Um, so when you're, when you mentioned something, again, something super, super interesting in that um, the, the modulation of the senescent cells, that essentially what it does is it helps to repair within the immune system. And then if we're going back to what we first started this podcast for, which uh, in the very first episode, which is to upregulate the immune system, is that all we're, at end of the day, is that the end product of this particular peptide that mimics the nicotine thing, it yes, will yes. upregulate your immune system. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, it does. Wow, it, it absolutely helps. It will. It, it helps it balance the immune simple. system again. Yeah. yeah, it's um, it's a modulator. It's a, uh, it's because the immune system is out of balance. Okay, and and just as I've said that, so smoking if you saturate these receptors in a bad way, these nicotinic receptors, you are altering your immune system also. So that, that makes sense then why these people, why smoking and uh, people can be more 
um, in trouble with like the coronavirus and things Absolutely. like that because they don't have that immune response like potentially you or I would have. Yeah. So there's there's a lot to it. It's it and it's um it's all fascinating. Yeah. That's that's really cool stuff. And full circle. I don't know if you've heard me say that, but it's just like, everything's coming back to that. You kept saying in the beginning, and I didn't understand it until just recently, but it's like everything is about not just the cell, but, but it, 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 like one level up from the cell is like the immune system and your body, what we can actually feel. And it is absolutely much more evident. Um, okay. Well, my last question about this, and I promise I'll let you go. Yeah. Um, the, so old time smoking. So I used to be a smoker. I was a smoker for about, gosh, like almost 20 years. And I quit, um, I quit <laughs> about three years ago. Uh, and had a relapse, but I, I'm, I'm done with it now, um, ever since meeting you. Um, and so it's, it's, what about me, right? Am I, am I just screwed because I've, I was smoking for such a long period of time and, um, I feel great now, right? Ever since I stopped smoking, it's been, it's been remarkable, uh, brain, body, everything, skin, everything. Uh, but, um, is, is it, is it repairable at that point or is it like just gone and I've just stopped, stopped it from getting worse? Um, what about the quitters like me? You're screwed. <laughs> Just, goodbye. Cruel world. <laughs> we might as well end this podcast. <laughs> no, you're, you're not. You remember. So, so th it just can take, it can take a couple of years. It doesn't just happen overnight. Yes. So if you do things right, it's related to time and this has to do with epigenetics, actually. We we know the epigenetics, and and this is something that is reversible, and this is something we've we've studied on the epigenetic side and looking at the methylation things because we didn't methylation markers. We didn't talk about that with this vaping, but what you're actually doing is you're changing DNA with vaping, and you're oh, wow. you're, you're causing mutations of DNA with vaping, and that leads to changes that are these things called methylation changes that are significant. And it has everything to do with the epigenome and how that epigenome affects the genes that transcribe messaging to make proteins that are further messengers in the body that can change what is the phenotype of the cell, meaning the cell doesn't perform like it's supposed to. I know that's long winded, but it's kind of a, it, it's really what's happening. So to change the epigenome, we already know the numbers. Um, so if you smoke 20 years, it can take up to two years or longer to reverse, to get back to a, a better epigenome. Uh -huh. Now, now do you, do you reverse it a hundred percent? Um, we think you do. We think you possibly can. Um, and it just has to do with years smoking and age, uh, but it just takes longer. So like if you've only smoked for five years or less or something like that, it may only take you uh, six to eight months to turn that around. Mm -hmm. But for longer term people who take it seriously and do it the right way, it's gonna take you about two years. Wow. And that's to change the epigenome and we've studied, it's been studied. So that's, uh, I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, we can pull these things out and discuss them. Um, we it, have to hit that topic. I, I just had like 20 more questions that I typed out for the next episode, all related to the DNA methylation and the triggers of this, because this is very important stuff. We talk yes. about anti-aging, especially in women, right? Like we care so much about our skin and all of this is related. If you have a bad immune system, and this is what like totally just like blew my mind last time in the very first episode, Doc, is when, uh, cause I, I, I asked Doc about skincare mostly for my, from my, my health stuff. And he just keeps giving me these immune things. And I'm like, what about the creams? He's like, it doesn't matter. It's a, it's about your immune system and that makes everything better. And honestly, like, look, it's, it's looking pretty fly. It looks not mad about it. <laughs> Was not looking like this before Dr. Steve's. <laughs> it's because we're working from the inside out and it's, we're working at the cell I level. Like that. And that's, that makes sense to people because that's really what happens. So I'll go against anybody who wants to put any cream on their face. 
and I will always win because I know how to change the cell from inside. And people will say, well, we'll put something, it'll get absorbed into the cell and it'll change it. And I'm gonna say bullshit. Um, I'm sorry about that. Our phones, everybody. <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry about that. It's okay. Can you still see me? Yeah, I can, I can. Okay. Yeah. I didn't say that bad word. I mean, you, you again, I have more questions to ask about. So we, we will get to all of these fascinating topics, um, especially with the skincare stuff, because that is, that is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. But I almost, I have one last question and I swear to God, I'll let you go, Doc. Um, the, the skincare stuff, the, the, he, the changing from the cell from within to get the skincare that you desire, um, it's, all, it's definitely more long-term, right? It's gotta be. Wait, you're, it, you're, the, the stuff you put on your face, I shouldn't say stuff because there are lots of there are lots of lots and lots of claims made about peptides in in cosmetics. That drives me in just crazy because there are some that are active and that work, and then there are some that are just total baloney. And I don't have enough time in the day to go through all that, and I certainly don't want to get in trouble with any companies that are going to come after me. <laughs> um, but I would just say you got to do your homework. How about that? But but what I like to say is you got to work from the inside for longer term goals. And that's all about the cell efficiency. You know, working, it, it only makes sense. You know, if I'm working on the heart to make it more efficient, I'm also working on the bowel. I'm working on the skin. I mean, it's like, it's like you said, Doc, I noticed my skin. I noticed my hair. I noticed my nails. Well, guess what? We're working on everything. Everything. And and it's working on the inside, giving the cell what it needs to serve to do a better job long term, not short term to, you know, make you want to buy this stuff every week to put on your face. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, and I think you, it, I think it certainly adds, right? Because I, you know, that I make some of these things and I made them special for you and mm -hmm. for some people, and. And it works. <laughs> it works really well, in com but it works in combination really well because you're doing more. Yeah. You're working on the inside and the outside at the same time. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's the secret. And the exercise and the diet and all that good stuff that keeps people healthy right there. You've been, you've been saying it. We, we listened to the past episodes with the super nutrition and the muscle mass and all these things working in tandem. Um, end of the day, it's, it, you, you've been saying this from the start, you want to empower your listeners, you want to empower your people with the knowledge to make the right decisions for themselves. And if you are going to smoke because you're addicted to nicotine, use a patch. <laughs> well, I think, it's a, I think it's a good way to get yourself out of it. And there are other ways. I mean, yeah, that's another thing we could talk about with addiction and peptides. I mean, there are some great things we do for people to get them uh, you know, off of, uh, some significant, uh, significant drugs and alcohol wow. and everything. Yeah. Yeah. So fascinating stuff, folks. You definitely don't want to miss next episode where we talk about all a bunch of nefarious dealings. <laughs> Let's talk about the all the things that we get addicted to and how we can get unaddicted to them. <laughs> all right, folks, thank you so much for joining us. And Dr. Seeds, thank you for being here and for answering all of my questions and all of our listeners' questions with such great detail. Uh, you rock. We'll see you next week, folks. Thank you, Karen.